So I'm Steve Nathan. Uh, my role is I'm the HR director in the Department of Work and Pensions for the technology and transformation functions in DWP. So uh, just give you a sense of the scale and, and size of what we're doing in the Department of Work and Pensions. We've got 85,000 colleagues in the organization. We've got 850 sites, which includes 720 job centers uh, in every high street in the UK. So you kind of get some sense of like, you know, in terms of having a lot of people out there and it feeling a bit like a retail organization. It can feel a bit like that. The organization, we've got 170 billion pounds flowing through the organization. So uh, the treasury write the checks for us, revenue customs collect the money. And then what we're doing is making uh, small payments out to people through the benefit system to help keep them out of poverty. Uh, so 170 billion, that's about 10% of the UK's GDP. Um, and the purpose of our organisation is about helping people come out of poverty and helping them stay out of poverty. So we've got things like the disability agenda for government, we've got the, uh, the unemployment, getting people back into work agenda, and we've got the pensions agenda, which is about helping people save for, uh, for their retirement. So uh, I was going to talk about HR's role in transformation. So I thought I'd start with how did I get into HR, because it's quite interesting, because I, I used to be a program manager, program director. And I was working on a big program in the Home Office, in the Home Office turnaround, when everything was going horribly wrong for the Home Office 10 years ago. And uh, I was sent in as the program director to go and sort out the HR function, who were going, you know, they were kind of just about holding the transactional end of things together. And uh, can you go and talk to them about leadership? Can you talk to them about culture and get them to kind of deliver on that kind of stuff? So somehow I managed to go from that position to kind of becoming the HR director that's talking back to the program managers about you need to be doing this stuff as well. So it's been kind of an interesting journey for me. Uh, and I've got a few slides here. I'll talk about some of my experience, but I'm also really keen to make this interactive. So um, given there's a lot of experience in the room, I'll touch on a few things as we go through the slides, but I'm not intending to kind of just give you a great big lecture on this kind of stuff. I'd really like to kind of hear your questions, your thoughts, and your reflections as we go through. So it's a bit about me and a bit about Department of Work and Pensions. So I kind of started thinking about what are the problems that we face as HR leaders, and this kind of stuff gets talked about a lot and my slides were looking a bit boring, so I started drawing on them. So either go for the pictures or the words, or you can do both. So um, we talk a lot about the challenge of HR having the credibility at executive uh, team level. How do we get in with the boards, have the right conversation with the boards? We had some fantastic examples this morning of uh, our colleagues being able to do that. But what is it we're going to talk about when we, when we get there? Do we have the capability to drive transformation? That's a really live debate for us at the moment in Department of Work and Pensions. Do we have the right capability in HR? Have we got the right skills? Are we deploying them the right way? All that kind of stuff. Um, th that's the guy with the spanner and the hammer, by the way, and the question mark above his head. Delivery capacity. So I'm sure lots of people have been in this, this situation where you know the change is going on. You know what you want to do. Yeah, I want some organization design. I want some culture change. I've got one person that knows all that stuff in my organization. I need to deploy them across 15 work streams. Uh, I need to be in five meetings all at the same time. So kind of the capacity element of it is really interesting. And then there's also a debate going on about is transformation part of being strategic HR as well, which we might, uh, I've obviously got a view, but we might touch on that as well. So you're getting some HRD, some organisations going, look, you know, we do the strategic HR stuff, but like transformation isn't really part of that. And others of us are going, actually, maybe that really needs to be central. So this ties into kind of what's the big picture for us as HR leaders in the profession. But my view is, HR really, it's kind of, we are really needed in transformation, whether we think we should be doing it or not, we are absolutely needed. So, um, so firstly, change leadership and helping leaders understand what does a great leader look like? How are you gonna set that future vision? How are you gonna get people to co-create that? How are you gonna engage your teams in what the future needs to look like? I think as HR, we've, uh, we've gotta be part of that. I've seen examples where that hasn't, happened, even in my own organisation in the past that hasn't happened, and what's happened is the leaders have gone off over the hill and many people have been left behind in the organisation, the leaders looked back over their shoulder and the organisation became so disjointed, people, the leaders didn't know how to relate back to people in the organisation and people in the organisation didn't really understand what leaders were talking about. You hear about change fatigue uh, if, you, if you kind of come to these kind of things. Um, but I think human beings have got enormous capacity 
to keep going with change and to stay with change and to be part of change, if you can kind of get that stuff right in an organisation, get those connections right in the organisation. I think as HR we've got a key role in helping leaders navigate their own organisation, so understand what are likely to be the responses, what are the dynamics in the organisation. So I think as HR we've really got to uh, play a big role in coaching people, coaching our leaders to do that. Um, people are social beings, they need to interact with each other. So um, one of the interesting examples of this is around organisation design. So um, I think we've all probably had that experience where you're doing organisation design and um, the boss has been away for a week and they come back and they've kind of been sketching some stuff out on the back of an envelope. And I was trying to think, like, what, what is it about organisation design that so attracts leaders to keep on fiddling around with it? And I think organisation design is about a set of really strong signals that you give to people about what their behaviour is going to be. So um, if you say, uh, Steve, you're a, a finance person, Steve, you're an HR person, or Steve, you're a change person, it's a really strong set of signals about my behaviour. If, if you tell me I'm a finance person, I'm going to start worrying about the finances of the organisation, where are the numbers going. If you tell me I'm a change person, I'm going to start worrying about what the plan looks like. So starting to think about things like organisational design as a set of behavioural cues for the organisation that will help people understand how they fit in with it, what behavioural expectations are there for them, and how do those behavioural expectations fit with other parts of the organisation. So that if you're sketching out an org chart, you might not be thinking of that, but I think it's an example of how we as HR people can bring a very different set of insights into, into the leadership community about uh, what's going on. And obviously maximising the benefits of doing change while well minimising the impacts of doing it badly. So there'll be some interesting examples of that. So, um, so in our own organisation, um, if... Uh, if you look at where we've been, our journey over the last four years in the Department of Work and Pensions, um, we've shrunk in size quite a bit. It's been very interesting. We've lost probably 20,000, 30,000 roles over the last five years across our organisation. So as the economy has picked up, uh, we've had fewer people doing interviews with people that are looking for, for work. And contrary to a lot of expectation and belief about organisations, at the same time as that, we've seen engagement increase across our organisation. So we've invested really heavily in what's our leadership story, what do people need to know about where we're going, how do we explain the role that people can play in the future of our organisation, how do we get those conversations to happen at multiple levels from the exec team where, as HR people, we're kind of coaching that conversation, bringing people together to uh, talk about where are we going and why and what people's different values and different beliefs about where we might be going, and then helping carry that organize, organizational conversation through all the levels of the organization so that the leaders that are working on the first floor of Chatham Job Centre are having exactly the same type of conversation about where do we want to go, what's important to us, what's the sh future shape of the organization, and what's our role in, in playing a part in that. And trying to carry those kind of conversations through at the same time as we've been decreasing in size has helped us increase engagement, helped us increase performance, provide the platform for incredible organizational performance at the same time as we've been uh, decreasing our size. So, and we've been told, a lot of people have told us, you can't do that kind of organisational transformation and carry people with you. So we're really proud of the fact that we've managed to, uh, to change that. So I was thinking, what, what are we going to do as HR leaders about the fact we've got these challenges, about you know, do we have the credibility, do we have the capacity? And what we're going to do about it when we're working with transformation, organizations, organizational transformations. So if we did have that confidence that we could have those conversations at the most senior levels in organizations, what would we be talking about? And what are some of the things that, um, in my experience, my great colleagues um, have been doing or I've been trying to do? So um, getting clarity about transformation objectives. And I think as HR, we could play a key role both in making sure that's people-centric and that people really uh, are at the heart of how we're describing how we transform organisations, but also helping senior teams um, put, put all their beliefs and their values on the table and helping shape up transformational objectives they can really believe in and buy in and go through the hard work of changing organisations with some of their kind of belief and value on, on the table. So that might be something we talk about in the, in the Q&A. Um, we should be talking, obviously, about business objectives, what success 
looks like in our businesses, making sure we're applying our business insights into that. Um, one of the things we've been doing in the technology function is uh, making sure that as the technology for function for DWP are really strongly connected to what's happening um, in the public domain, really strongly connected to what's happening to Department of Work and Pensions customers, making sure that connection to customers tracks all the way back to what's happening day to day inside the technology function. Now, if you ever work with some techies, you know that can be pretty hard, but getting the techies to both spend time with customers, getting the techies to spend time with their colleagues in the organisation, and getting them to really understand what's the impact of those day to day choices they've got uh, in how they do their jobs on their colleagues across the wider organisation and on the, on the public um, has really been one of the big cultural shifts that has got them much more focused on uh, why they want to change their own organisation. Um, we've got things like transformation roadmaps, so this is, uh, uh, there's lots of different ways of doing this, but what's our role in coaching uh, transformation teams and coaching leaders in shaping transformation journeys, putting the pieces of the jigsaw together as you go through change. So it makes sense from an individual and a people perspective. So we can help turn the lens around so that um, rather than it being kind of building blocks of Lego in an organization and trying to work out kind of how do the finances, how do all these pieces all sit together, we can help organizations turn the lens around. So they're looking, how does this land from a people's perspective? How does this make sense to our people? What are the questions people are likely to ask about this? And how can we help anticipate those questions and actually design transformation journeys so they make the best possible sense to the people that will be going through that change? Because, of course, organisations are, in my view, organisations are just about the people. The buildings, the equipment isn't what drives organisations. It's, it's got to be the, the people. Um, people insights. So um, we've had some great examples this morning, some of the different sessions about some of the people metrics that help you understand how you're going to shift organisations. So some of the work we've been doing most recently as we go through some of our more recent changes is work out where are the organisational hotspots, where do we need to provide extra support to people, where have we got concerns about things like quality of leadership, concerns about turnover, concerns about sickness rates. So how can we use our analytical capability to really understand um, where change is likely to be difficult, but also where is change likely to be successful? And how can we use that to navigate through an organisation that's going through change? Can we pick the areas where we know this is going to be easiest to make it happen, use those as exemplars? Um, but also use our more informal insights about who's likely to be on board with this, what are likely to be the, the challenges and the difficulties. So again, kind of contributing all of that kind of insight into, uh, into some of the senior teams that we work with day to day. And then finally, leadership. And this comes in lots of different aspects, of course, but um, I really believe as HR leaders, we need to be leaders of the businesses that we're part of. So how do we take real ownership and demonstrate that ownership of the overall success of the, the business? How do we help those senior teams uh, create their vision for where they're, where they're going and engage people in that? Um, I think the example I've been most proud of so far has been for the whole of the Department of Work and Pensions. Um, prior to this role, I was head of OD. And uh, one of the things I noticed about the organisation, it's really difficult to be a leader. Hugely complex organisation, stuff going on all the time. Someone mentioned this morning about kind of the corporate centre setting operational changes, uh, setting the direction for operational changes across an organisation, and reams and reams of paper coming out to the front line. It was absolutely like that in DWP five years ago. Huge amounts of paper coming out to the front line saying, you know, we're going to change this process step, we want to change this bit of guidance, we want to change this, this kind of rule. And lots of change, multiple change programs, multiple pieces of change programs arriving all over the organisation all at one time in a pretty difficult to manage way. Um, and collectively we had this insight about actually we've kind of lost track of where we're taking the organisation. There's a lot of change going through the organisation, but what is it that binds us together? So starting with the executive team, we had a conversation about is our, is our story clear and is our story coherent across the whole? organisation. Um, and of course the executive team said to me, yes of course it is. So I said, well can you just help me and I'll, I'll write it down, I'll just compare and then you know, I'll stop bothering you about this. But of course as we started to write it down then, very different views about where we were going and why, very different views about how we should be responding to what the government was asking of us at that time. So uh, what we did was spend a lot of time with that executive team together talking about 
what is important to you right now? What's important about this job? Why are you coming and doing this job as opposed to any other? Where do you want to take this organisation? What's your personal ambition for this organisation? What's your personal ambition within this organisation? What are you trying to do with it? And we got them talking about that. And out of that, we developed a story for the whole organisation, which is still very active out there. So we take about 15,000 of our colleagues through, um, uh, through iterations of this story about every six months, talk to them about what's current, link it back to that overall story of the organisation. And that's one of the things that's really helped kind of bind the organisation together as all these small changes land. People got much more confidence in that big picture, much more confidence the organisation's being run in a coherent manner. It helps them absorb the change. It helps them work out from a personal perspective what do they need to do to help drive the organisation's success. And that's worked at kind of many, many levels through the, through the organisation. So if we had confidence in our credibility, we'd be driving those kind of things, I, I suggest. I'd be really interested in your views in a, in a moment about it. If we had the capability, what kind of things would we be working on? Um, and some of this would be very familiar to you, so I think we'd be taking a systems-based approach to the change. We'd be looking across how to things like our HR policies, our recruitment principles, our talent, our performance management processes support this, how do the finance and budgeting processes support how the organisation is changing, how the behaviours support it, what are we doing about culture. Um, but we'd be looking beyond that into other parts of what the organisation does. How does the technology choices we're making as organisations support this? How do the locations and the environment choices support what we're doing? And again, I think we're uniquely positioned to get our heads around that within organisations and make a difference on that. We'd be helping organisations increase their change capacity and also their change agility. Uh, so something I believe about organisations is that we're finding really hard in a lot of organisations is to reduce people's levels of anxi anxiety about coming to work and doing a good job. I notice a lot of the kind of processes that organisations are starting to put in place um, increase levels of uh, anxiety. People feel very judged. I had a bit of conversation about that this morning. So how can we as HR in help reduce those anxieties but also equip people to go through change faster and equip people to be more agile about change? Another really interesting insight about the civil service is um, on some kinds of change, the civil service can act incredibly rapidly. So um, if we need to move one part of government over to another part of government, you know, if, if you think about uh, Martin this morning, if we need to move the prisons from the Home Office to the Ministry of Justice, we can do this overnight, where it takes about two weeks for us to sort it. Other kinds of changes, of course, and you'd have your own view about them, maybe the civil service isn't quite so uh, nifty at. But by knowing what our core values are as an organisation, knowing what we stand for, knowing what is stable and what we're going to keep stable, I already believe that is part of what allows the civil service to react so quickly when it needs to, uh, needs to do stuff very quickly. So improving the change capacity and the agility by being really thoughtful about how do people respond to change and how do we support them, how do we give them a sense that some of the stuff is stable, coherent, leads to making good judgments. Improving engagement, we've talked a bit about building capability in the organisation. So how do we equip our colleagues across organisations to acquire the skills that they need to work within uh, new models? So it's a big challenge for, uh, for us at the moment. So we're shifting a lot of our technology functions in government, including DWP, from um, two or three years ago, big outsource contracts to bringing that back in-house and now building digital systems uh, that work for the public and work for our colleagues we're building those systems as fast as possible. Now, any organisation that's got a, a significant digital component has really got some big challenges at the moment about how do you acquire that talent, how do you bring in people that are a cultural fit with what you're doing, um, which, which we're on with as well. But we've got a lot of existing colleagues that are incredibly bright, really engaged with the values and the, the purpose of our organisation. How can we best equip them to build the skills they need and the confidence they need to operate within a shifting model there. Uh, shaping the culture, of course, and also taking joint accountability for the, the business outcomes and the financial outcomes. 
uh, and again, some, some really interesting times that I've had as you've downsized organisations. How can we as HR be really confident when we go through the numbers, that we're sharing the assumptions that finance are making, rather than just kind of acting as a delivery mechanism? I think let's, let's push ourselves into kind of being the ones that challenge finance on, you know, what, what is driving this affordability scenario? Do we really understand the assumptions that are behind it? Do we, do we get their model? Have we been through their model and understood it and kind of made the tweaks that we know are needed as, as HR experts? So that's if we had the capability, we'd be doing those kind of things. And if we had the capacity, of course, we'd be just getting on it and, you know, there's a bunch of people there all following that, that big arrow. So we're going to come on to the conversation bit now. I'm really interested in your, your views about this. We'll have a conversation together about it. So I think it's a real big risk in waiting for the capacity, capability and credibility to be all in place and exactly as we'd want them before we start acting in this way. I think we'll build the capacity, capability and credibility by taking on some of these challenges and starting to talk about some of these challenges, some of the sources of insight that we've got and how we can make a difference up front. Start doing that straight away. I think that's what will build our confidence. I think that's what will build our credibility. That's certainly been my experience. So it's hard to build the capacity and the capability in those teams without having that conversation beforehand. Um, but certainly, kind of, you know, in this role, doing DWP technology, we've consistently pushed the HR offer absolutely to the forefront of how can we make a difference on these things? How can we uh, shape some of these transformations so it addresses some of those kind of issues that I've talked about? Um, and we're not at all doing this thing of waiting for a kind of herd of badly drawn unicorns to come uh, and rescue us. It's kind of like, let's, let's take control of our own destiny, transform our own HR offer by being really ambitious about where we want to be. So that is, that's kind of my proposal for us. Um, I'd really like to not really take questions, but like get into a debate about it, hear some of your experiences, and just have a conversation together about how can we do the best possible job of uh, ensuring HR is absolutely at the heart of uh, the organisations that we work in, at the heart of the success of the organisations we work in, and at the heart of making change a really positive experience for the people in our organisations. So, Thank you, and I'd just love, love to throw it open and see what people think. Yeah, go on. Is there an argument that an organisation can be simply too big to transform? So I'm thinking of DWT, which I think is at least 5,000. Yep. Um, so I, I think there's several parts of being able to answer that. Our experience over the last five years would be DWP hasn't been too large to transform at 85,000. Um, but what you've got to do is kind of divide the problem up into manageable chunks. So if you start thinking about a very complex system, all the benefit rules, the different functions that are within that, the different teams, it's possible to conceive of things in a way that's too complex to deal with. And I, one, of my, one of my things is when people start talking about culture change, there's a set of assumptions that go when we talk about culture change about um, uh, it's going to be complex and it's going to take a long time. And I don't think those are helpful assumptions to make when you're thinking about shifting people's behaviours. But what we've managed to do is a mix of this very engaging leadership. Uh, we've done a lot of having our top 40, 50 leaders on the road in every job centre, talking to people about what's going on and why, talking about what behaviours are needed, getting that aligned to things like performance management, talent management systems, getting technology changes, skills, learning and development changes lined up. So as people get new roles, as new roles come online, they're getting the systems, the support, the processes and the training they need to do that. Um, I think at this kind of scale, you've got to be quite persistent in making it happen, um, but we've seen real shifts. When I started five years ago, DWP was a very fragmented organisation. There were several different chunks of the organisation delivering in very different ways. Technology, HR, finance were very distributed across the organisation. And it felt like a kind of conglomerate of four or five lumps. Today it feels very bound together. People at all levels in the organisation understand that pulling together and working across the boundaries is what makes the organisation successful. They know in a way that I don't think was very clear five years ago, that what they do really matters to the public. They're not just there as part of a large mechanism 
to kind of make a thing happen, there's a much bigger picture. And I think a lot of that is down to that collective effort of uh, leaders across the organisation to sell, to sell what the transformation is, sell what we're going through, and then also take personal responsibility for making sure if they're in charge of some changes, they land in a way that's going to make sense to people that is coordinated and that brings together those different aspects of change. But, you know, we've got other people from the public sector who might have different views. Go on. The super tank, I think, has also got big implications for the team that are driving the transformation, whether that's your executive team or your project team. And I'm interested in your, your experience of this, but the impact on that team, they very much kind of go through waves of optimism and pessimism, was, was my experience. <laughs> what a great question. It would be this, just like this room, I think. Um, I, so my experience is focusing on the skills just kind of sends you in a loop of like, I always want better people. And I don't know if other organisations are finding this. We're obsessing about capability uh, in the civil service. And we have capability plans and we have capability boards and we're kind of looking at all the skills that we need in a quite obsessive way about our organisation. And that drives a really fascinating set of dynamics in the organisation because um, you're in a large organisation, everyone's measuring capability, but everyone's like interested in what you're delivering as well. And within all the politics of it, you've got to be quite crazy to go, yeah, I've got all the capability that I need. Um, so what we end up doing is kind of describing this deficit and kind of reinforcing this deficit and going to boards talking about, you know, I've got a deficit, I've got a deficit in my skills, my skills base because that very moment you go, I've got all the skills I need, people are like, well, surely it's job done then, you should have finish delivering everything that's required. And that's quite an odd conversation. So um, I think what you need is, uh, you need a team that's got the, that confidence and that belief and that desire to really make something happen. I think that's got to be the heart of it. And then you can start learning some of the skills, you can start acquiring some of the skills. Um, I've always had this thing of the best change teams, they feel a bit like, um, in the early Star Wars films, they, they feel a bit like that little crew of you know Chewbacca and Han Solo and, uh, and Luke Skywalker and, and Princess Leia. They're quite 
diverse, I guess, if that's, if that's possible to describe those four characters like that. They're quite diverse. They're quite a small group. There's very high levels of trust, very high levels of desire to make something feel different. Not always quite got the exact mix of skills that you need. There's a lot of learning to do along the way. I've always found that work much better than, uh, than having those kind of teams where it's like, you know, I've got, I've got the world's best organization design person, I've got the world's best systems person, I've got the world's best culture change person, and I, you've got the world's best HR strategist, and kind of like, let's go and work out what we're going to do with those, those kind of skills. Once people are really motivated to do something, they will learn really quickly. Um, if you've got the support of the business and you go, look, look there's just one, is one kind of special, um, badly drawn unicorn shaped person that I need for this, and you've got the support and the buy-in and that sense of collaboration between yourself and, and the overall business. I've never found it's a problem to go and acquire the money or to go and find the right person. And when the right person hears about what you're up to, they're like, wow, that sounds like a great opportunity. So I always do it that other way around, like let's throw ourselves into this, let's kind of get that motley crew together and then, um, then kind of lead it from, lead it from there. Um, so I can share some of my experience, but I think I must be really lucky or really foolish and kind of pulled it off somehow. So, um, so I joined the Department of Work and Pensions and I remember getting a phone call on the Sunday afternoon before I was going to start on the Monday going, um, I know you've got the six week induction plan, but can you go and have a chat with the executive team about what you're going to be doing first? Because we want to reshape the organisation. We've got all the directors coming together on the Wednesday afternoon and we need to reshape it and take 40% of the cost out. Um, and somehow I survived but um, so I, I probably had like the world's best invitation there for an OD person to go and go and do something I wasn't trying to kind of bust doors open particularly it was rather gaping wide as a uh, gaping a, a barn door gaping wide open for me to throw myself into I think I think I'd tie it back to some of the things I was talking about here I, I think throw yourself into making sure you've got really great insights into what's making the business operate what the business needs to be successful and start from there because that's what other people in the business want to talk to you about that's kind of what does i believe unlock unlock doors for hr um, it's easy to be it's easy to fall to that temptation of being expertise led as an od person so you know um some of the od people i've worked with are, are very much kind of like i've read this great article i've read this great book i've been to a great conference and heard a great insight and they want to they want to share that and often i think let's start kind of closer to home within our own organisations and, and set it from there. Um, I obviously, in that situation, being thrown into kind of a room of people who were worried about their jobs and worried about the future of their organisation, um, I had to learn about the business really quickly. I had no choice, otherwise my credibility would have been um, straight through the floor very quickly. So it kind of forced me into a position of learning about the business, what made the business tick, and kind of being very inquisitive and curious about that. And I think that helped me establish an OD function then that was very business outcome focused and felt very close to what the organisation was trying to, trying to do. So I'm, I'm not saying let's forget about the expertise, but try and marshal that expertise in service of what our organisations are trying to do. Oh, we've got time for a couple more. Six minutes over. Oh my goodness. <laughs> go on, like, just one more, one more and I'll let you go. Another, it can be an insight or a thought or a reflection, it doesn't need to be. Okay, so um, we've barely scratched the surface. I don't know where all the time went. It's a, this is a really interesting, exciting topic. Um, so I'd, lo I'd love to kind of get into a conversation over coffee about it. Obviously, it's like government, so I'm not going to stand up here kind of like, you know, revealing all the, all the hidden horrors. There are always some, though. So, um, but I'm really happy to have a conversation over coffee and kind of like get into a bit more detail, share some of what's worked and what hasn't. So thank you very much for listening, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.